Hey everyone, um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, his name is Mark Mewson. Uh, he's Dr. Mewson is a professor of biomedical informatics and of biomedical data science at Stanford University, where he's a director of the Stanford Center for Biomedical Informatics Research. Dr. Mewson conducts research related to open science, intelligent systems, computational ontologies, and biomedical decision support. His group developed Protege, the world's most widely used technology for building and managing terminologies and ontologies. He has served as principal investigator of the National Center for Biomedical Ontology, which is one of the original national centers for, bio, for biomedical computing created by the U.S. National Institutes of Health. Um, he also directs the Center for Expanded Data Annotation and Retrieval, CEDAR, um, which is the talk he's going to give now, uh, founded under the NIH Big Data Knowledge Initiative. Uh, CEDAR develops semantic technology to ease the authoring and management of biomedical experimental metadata. So Mark, uh, without further ado, please take it away. Thanks for waking. I'm, I'm really excited to be here, and, and I think this is really a fantastic opportunity. I'm really glad that CMU has recognized the importance of bringing together people interested in both AI and, and, and data management and data, data reuse. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about CEDAR, which is a project we've been working on at Stanford for the, about the past five years. And I'm going to be talking to you about the problems of accessing data and why getting data, uh, at least experimental data online is so hard and why you know, I think data reuse is such a challenging and important problem. Earlier today, when Melissa Hendel gave her talk, she made the statement that we basically need to have better data in order to have good AI. I'm going to argue in this talk that we actually need to have good uh, AI in order to generate even better data. And the emphasis here is on what AI is going to do to make the online data available for all of us more useful. We've also heard a lot of talk today already about the FAIR principles and the idea that data reuse requires data that are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And that mantra has been just sort of with us for the past five years, and everybody agrees that if we want to be able to reuse data, we need to have FAIR data in the first place. Great idea. The problem is when you look online and see what is actually available for reuse, almost all data are not fair. They're not fair because the fair principles are, you know, in their own way, rather obtuse. Uh, they're principles. They're not easily uh, uh, operationalizable in a way which makes it easy for us to take these principles and ensure that the data sets that we, we create are really fair. And what that means is that when you look at the data repositories that exist in science, and I'm going to say up front that I'm biased because I work in biomedicine, and so most of the data that I see are biomedical. But fundamentally, we have a, we have a problem because uh, investigators view their work as publishing papers. Nobody thinks that their work is to leave a legacy of reusable data. All the sponsors right now are getting very excited about FAIR and saying that data sharing is important. But they don't really pay investigators to share their data. And most important, this is where, where my emphasis is going to be today, is that data are not going to be fair unless the metadata that describe data sets are themselves fair. And getting metadata that are fair is really hard. So here, here's some sample metadata. This is a random record given to me by one of my, my coworkers from NCBI, the National Center for Biomedical uh, Biotechnology Information at the National Library of Medicine. This is for a data set that was uh, put online by Genentech. And this is what metadata look like. Usually there are sets of attribute value pairs and they describe the data that are online. They describe in particular, what is the experimental situation that led to the creation of those data? And that all, this all looks pretty good when you look at it you know, from, a, from a high level. But when you sort of look at exactly what the investigator here is putting into the put into the metadata, well, carcinoma hepatocellular it tells you what the disease is, but it's not a standardized term. Uh, saying that the ethnicity is Japanese is a bit odd. Uh, saying that the age is 57 year, not 57, not years plural, is also odd. And if you were to search for Asians with hepatocellular carcinoma, you wouldn't get this record if you're doing a search online because the metadata don't give you the information that you need in a form that makes the metadata useful. And indeed, you realize that you, we're, we're, we enter that situation because most of the time when people create metadata, they create metadata by filling out spreadsheets. 
and they're filling in spreadsheets that give them very little guidance, don't really tell them what are the control terms they should be using, don't really tell them what are the ex what's the expected information in one of these metadata specimens. And, and, and what do you get is this. This is a, a look at the gene expression omnibus, one of the online databases at uh, NIH and provides information about a kind of high throughput biological experiment. And if you were to look at records and wanted to find the age of the subject, you would see a gazillion ways to represent age, 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 pop age, age after birth, age in years, and so on. Again, if you want to search for records and find patients of a certain age, not only do you have to anticipate how the investigator may have encoded the metadata to describe the age of the patient, but you have to think about what are all the variations about that? What are all the typos that could have been introduced into the metadata? And it becomes a real mess. And in fact, we looked at the biosample repository at NCBI. This is the repository of metadata regarding the samples that are re referred to in other kinds of uh, data at NCBI, which is supposed to be their best data set. And we'll say, despite the best efforts of NCBI, and the NCBI tries really hard, and despite the best efforts of, efforts of the investigators, they try really hard. Well, 73% of the Boolean metadata values are not actually Boolean. They're values like non-smoker and former smoker. 26% of the integer metadata values can't be parsed as numbers. There are things like JM52 and PIG. 68% uh, of the metadata entries that are supposed to represent biomedical ontologies don't. And so what we have is a situation where if you're an investigator trying to do data reuse, and you want to search online data sets, at least in biomedicine, at least using NCBI uh, resources, you're in a situation where despite all the best efforts of everybody involved, the metadata don't make it easy for you to do that. And I have colleagues at Stanford who are really good data parasites, so to speak. They spend weeks and weeks going through metadata by hand because the online search capability is, is so impoverished. And so that gets us back to the question of how do we make our data fair? And honestly, we're in a situation where we recognize that at minimum, we need access to experimental data sets. We need mechanisms to search for metadata to find the relevant experimental results. We need annotation of online data sets with adequate metadata so we actually know what investigators did. We need controlled terms so that we're not looking for variant spellings and typos. And we need a culture that actually cares about all this, where the investigators who create metadata recognize that really they are creating data sets, putting them online because there are going to be new discoveries that will, will be made from their data, and that they have a vested interest in making sure that their data are as reusable as possible. Well, that's all good. And how, the real question is, how do we get there? And we get there, number one, by making sure that we're using standard ontologies to describe what exists in a data set completely and consistently. And fortunately, at least in biomedicine where I work, we've had good ontologies around for about 300 years. And so this is Linnaeus who created the system for speciation in biology, uh, which is probably what all of us learn in high school. And this uh, particular kind of ontology for identifying species of living organisms is just one example of the many hundreds of ontologies that are available in biology and medicine. Uh, in some sense, having hundreds of ontologies in biology and medicine is a problem. But the good news is uh, we at Stanford have been working for many years on a system called BioPortal. BioPortal is an open online system that gives you access to basically all the publicly available biomedical ontologies that exist. If you go to Bioportal, you'll see that we have hundreds of ontologies. Many of them are standard ontologies used frequently in clinical medicine. Others are more uh, unique and, and, and created by investigators in very specialized areas of biology. But we can go to Bioportal, we can take a look at what kinds of ontologies are available. We can search them. We can identify, for example, all of the myriad terms in SNOMED CT that might be relevant for annotating a bio biomedical specimen. And we can uh, identify the terms that are necessary in order to make the metadata for our data sets more standardized and therefore more fair. That's good, but what about the actual structure of the metadata themselves? We need to be able to describe experiments completely and consistently 
so that the people who want to reuse those uh, uh, data can search them through the metadata in a way which is guaranteed to have maximum recall. And the real question is, how do we do that? Well, for 20 years, again, in biomedicine, uh, the people who do high throughput experiments called microarray studies have recognized that because their high throughput experiments generate thousands and thousands of data points, they're not going to publish the data in a journal, they're going to put them online, and they have to make their data searchable. And to do that, they recognized that it wouldn't be just adequate to put the data online, they needed metadata that would clarify what was the substrate of the experiment, what was the platform that was used, what were the experimental conditions, what were they trying to prove. And that led about 20 years to something called minimum information about a microarray experiment, or MIAMI. And MIAMI is more than just a clever acronym. It really is something that has revolutionized the way people in biology think about describing metadata. Because Miami said, look, it's not good enough to just say who you are and what your study was in very broad terms. These are the kinds of things you have to say about your study if someone else is going to reuse your data and make sense of those data. And Miami caught on like wildfire. And then not only do we get Miami, but the biological community recognized that for all the standardized kinds of high throughput experiments that they do routinely, there was a need to describe these minimum information models that would clarify what the metadata needs to describe in order for some third party to actually make sense about what experiment was done. And so we have Miata and uh, we have uh, Miriam and Minimes and Miss Fishy and really dozens and dozens of these standards that describe what are the minimal things you need to say about an experiment in order for someone to actually make sense of what you've done. And that is a really important, and it's not unique to biomedicine, but it's a really important attribute about the way people in biology think about creating metadata, which we could take advantage of in CEDAR. But you need more than just the ontologies, you need more than just the kinds of structures for creating metadata. Uh, you need, um, you need the ability to do this in a way which is convenient to the people who are running the experiments. You basically need to make it palatable to describe experiments completely and consistently. People who are doing experimental work love spreadsheets because they're so easy to use, because they're so familiar, but because they don't provide the information that's, that's necessary uh, often to dis, uh, do things in a structured way, what we really need are things like CEDAR, which provide a web-based platform that allow investigators to describe their experiments in ways which really clarify for themselves what they've done, clarify for the computer what they've done, and obviously clarify for third parties who want to reuse their data, what they can, they, what they can learn from the data that, that have been put online. So if you look at CEDAR, we can th see, think of CEDAR as an approach that has three steps. In the leftmost panel, we have an ability to create templates that describe metadata. And these templates are based often on the kinds of community-based standards like Miami, Miss Fishy, Minimas, and lots of others that are used to be able to describe uh, the information necessary to communicate what was done in, in a scientific experiment. In the center panel, we have technology that uses the template and fills in that template in order to make it possible to describe in detail what was done in a particular experiment. And so we have the metadata template created on the left. We have the actual metadata for a given experiment that uses that template created in the middle. And at the very right, we have the ability to export that information to some online repository, like the NCBI repositories or import or uh, C, uh, CGA, uh, CGA or a lot, a, lot, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of other repositories. And in the uh, middle panel, if you will, this uh, panel over here, the, where we say we explore and reuse data sets through metadata, we have the ability obviously to search metadata that had already created through CEDAR. But another element that we have, which I'll show you in a minute, is that we can use the metadata that have already been entered through CEDAR to learn patterns in those metadata. So we can use AI to understand structures in the metadata that can actually help us inform the acquisition of new metadata. By knowing our old metadata and understanding the patterns there, we have the ability to acquire information 
which allows us to ensure that the filling in of these metadata templates is as easy as possible for the investigators who are, who are trying to, to, to use them. So here's what Cedar looks like when you log in. Uh, you get a library of metadata templates. Uh, you can see templates you've created for a, for a variety of purposes. Suppose we're interested in biosample human. That's the template that allows us to enter metadata for describing samples that are going into the biosample database uh, at NCBI uh, that refer to human subjects. So we click on it, we say we want to populate it, and here's what a metadata template looks like in Cedar. It's a little bit cleaner than those spreadsheets that you saw earlier, and it's a set of attribute value pairs. There's a sample name, there's an organism, there's a tissue, there's a sex, there's an isolate perhaps, there's an age, and so on. And we can see that in this particular specimen, there was a person who was 74 years old, who had dermatitis, uh, and there was a cell line that was created, and more and more of these metadata will describe exactly what was, what was done uh, to create the sample that was used for a variety of experiments. Okay, so how do we create the template that we fill in that allows us to generate these metadata? Well, remember, the creating of the templates is the first step in our three-step process, and we have a whole easy-to-use web-based authoring system that allows us to describe a template. In this case, we're, we're entering information that describes the biosample human template that we've been talking about. We can say that there's a sample name, which is alphanumeric. There's an organism, which is alphanumeric. There's a tissue, which is also alphanumeric. But here we can say, we just don't want this to be a type in. We want this to be something where the value is selected from an ontology that already exists in that bioportal resource that I showed you earlier. And so the triangle uh, symbol that you see at the left-hand side of the, of, the of, of the information presented here suggests that we're going to be using a, um, an ontology to create the values. We click on search if we like. And what we can find out is that if we were to go to BioPortal, we would see that there's a lot of ontologies that talk about tissues. The best one is at the top. That's Uberon. And it suggests that Uberon might be the ontology we might want to use if we're going to ask a user down the road to enter information about tissues. And then we can go look and see what Uberon looks like. We can see that Uberon seems to have what looks like good selections for tissues. And so we can say, okay, let's go add Uberon. And so we've added Uberon to our template. And now if we want to actually annotate uh, uh, the, the, uh, the template, we want to annotate our data with metadata by filling in the template, we can see how to do that. We can see here's the biosample human template I showed you earlier. We can see that Uberon provides information on the tissue through a drop-down menu. And so instead of having to type in some random value for tissue, Cedar makes it really easy to say, okay, the tissue is gonna be taken from Uberon. And not only are we gonna show you the tissues that are in Uberon, we're not gonna show you uh, a few dozen tissues and make it really hard. We're going to use our knowledge of the previously entered metadata to put to the, at the top of the dropdown list those values that were selected most frequently by people who previously entered biosample and human metadata and talked about tissues. So by looking at our previous metadata, we can see that, for example, blood was the most frequently used tissue in the, in the samples that have been annotated previously. And therefore, there's a good, good bet that blood ought to be at the top of our list now and we can see, well, let's maybe we can just go select it. And if we look at other entries into this, this template, for example, suppose we said the tissue is lung and we wanna choose what disease might the specimen or the subject have had from which we took the specimen. Um, the list for the possible diseases is not an unordered list of all the diseases in the disease ontology, but they're ordered in accordance to what diseases have we previously seen when we've had metadata where the tissue was long and the species was homo sapiens. And we see we get selections like, like lung cancer, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and squamous cell carcinoma, and the kinds of things that we'd expect. So we can make it easy for the user to fill in metadata values by taking advantage of our, of our previous metadata entries and learning from them and doing uh, predictive data entry and reformatting our menus to make it really easy just to fill in these blanks. Now, is this going to be as easy for investigators as spreadsheets? People still love those spreadsheets a lot, but this approach has turned out to be really easy for us and easy for our collaborators. When we said the tissue was brain, 
then they get a new, a new drop down. They get Parkinson's disease and CNS lymphoma and autistic disorder, other kinds of uh, diseases that would be associated with the brain. And for every selection made through a template in, in CEDAR, we make it really, really easy by trying to learn as much as we can from previous metadata entries, making it simple to uh, click off menus or enter uh, other strings with, pre with, with predictive data entry, making it really fast and uh, not only fast, but, but, but very specific and very accurate to create comprehensive detailed metadata that becomes searchable and become usable by other investigators. So things that are important to remember about CEDAR uh, from an AI perspective is that all the semantic components that you see in CEDAR, the template elements that build up templates, the templates themselves, all the ontologies, the value sets that are used to fill in the blanks, all of these are managed as first-class entities. Most of them are stored in the BioPortal resource and make it possible for us to upload new versions of them and to edit them that th through that mechanism. And the user interfaces take advantage of all these semantic components by generating on the fly drop down menus, uh, whole forms, basically everything that you see in the Cedar UI for entering metadata is created on the fly through these semantic elements. What that means is if you want to change the metadata, you don't have to do any new programming, you don't have to do any new uh, UI development, you just change the template, you change the model. And from that, everything else follows. You get a new, you get a new user interface and you fill in the blanks. All the software components in Cedar have well-defined APIs, which make it really easy to have Cedar used by different clients that they want to get access to different parts of the system. And everything that you see here, all the metadata in Cedar is, is translated to JSON-LD, which is really convenient because we can translate that to RDF if you prefer RDF and lots of other formats that make it uh, really convenient to use a standardized representation to get access to all the information necessary to really understand the metadata that investigators have associated with their data sets. So we don't have spreadsheets anymore. We don't have to worry about making the mistake of putting things in the wrong row or column or not having access to the right ontologies. We don't have to worry about uh, a confusion of information because people are not uh, constrained to enter uh, ontology information, but still can only uh, put in information uh, related to the ontologies that the, ont that the template designers have suggested are appropriate. And we're in a situation now where we have lots and lots of folks using CEDAR, giving us feedback, telling us that by creating information through these kinds of templates, using ontology terms, doing it in a web-based manner, they're able to create metadata that they believe are going to be more useful than the kinds of poor quality metadata that we, that we know are extant in the biomedical resources that frequently are associated with scientific data sets. So I would argue that our online data are never going to be fair. They're not fair now, they never will be fair until we can identify the kinds of reusable templates that will give us in a standardized form what we want to say about bi biological experiments in particular and scientific experiments in general, in order to be certain that we're saying everything that we need for someone who's reusing our data to get information about what experiment was performed. We're not gonna have fair data until we can use controlled terms to fill in those templates so that our ontologies are giving us the guidance that we need to ensure that things are represented in a consistent way across experiments. And we need technology. We need technology that's going to make it easy for investigators to annotate their data sets in these standardized searchable fashions. And frankly, frankly, we need more than technology. We need a culture. We need the scientific enterprise to recognize that data reuse is important, that fair data are important, and that none of this is going to happen until we develop an infrastructure that will make it easy for investigators to be able to create the metadata that make, their metadata, that make their data sets useful, discoverable, and fair. So like the research parasites of the world, uh, people like Pradesh Khatri, my colleague at Stanford, are gonna have the opportunity to be able to learn from data sets that are cleaner and better organized, more searchable, if we can make the metadata better by using technology that gives us standardized templates and standardized ontologies in, a, in the way that CEDAR does. Scientists are going to be able to recognize that they can actually use intelligent agents to search for, to find new experiment, experimental results that other investigators are performing in a way which is much more specific than searching the literature 
which right now, which only gives us access to uh, abstracts or, or, or perhaps full text, but always with the limitations of natural language processing, with the opportunity of looking at the actual metadata that investigators enter in ways which could give them more information about the experiments that are being performed, more details about experimental structure that is really important when they want to know how to expand their research programs. And clinicians who want to get access to sign to get what, what, rather who want to get access to clinical data will be able to understand better how their uh, subjects uh, might be able to have situations relating to the subjects of, exper of, of so those who are in clinical trials in a way that helps us to match better the clinical trials that are available online with the subjects who may have different kinds of conditions so that we know what is the best scientific evidence that is available in order to know how to treat patients with unusual, with unusual conditions. Overall, we see this technology and what it will spawn as a mechanism whereby we can have investigators create very detailed, very structured, very machine interpretable descriptions of their experiments and add those to the kinds of metadata that are used routinely to describe experimental data sets online. And when that happens, technology such as CEDAR will allow the automated publication, if you will, of scientific results that go beyond the kinds of information that we have in on our current online journal articles and instead give us machine readable information at a level of detail that will allow our intelligent agents, if you will, to search and read the literature represented in the form of online metadata, integrate this information with existing data sets in ways which is not possible now, track scientific advances again with a level of specificity that goes beyond what is possible when just looking at the literature, to re-explore existing data sets. And because all of this is going to be machine processable, those agents can suggest what are the next experiments to perform, and given what's happening in robotics, these agents may actually be able to do those experiments on their own. Have to see what happens there. But in any of that, we see CEDAR as a mechanism which allows us to move beyond spreadsheets, to move beyond poor quality metadata, to move beyond data sets that are not fair, and to create data sets that are basically not only fair, but contain the kinds of structured comprehensive information that makes it possible for investigators to reuse data in ways that were never possible and to create new data sets online easily uh, so that the scientific uh, community can benefit from the work that's going on basically throughout. Let me stop there and see if you have any questions. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, please, anyone who has any questions, just speak up or feel free to put them in the chat and I can read them out. Hey, Mark, that was a great talk. Um, I wonder, is CEDAR available across fields or is it especially um, optimized for health data sets? Um, that's a good point. Uh, CEDAR is not biomedically specific. So obviously being in a school of medicine and being surrounded by biologists, uh, we use CEDAR all the time uh, in this area. And because most of my funding is from the NIH, our collaborators tend to be biomedical. But there is nothing specific to uh, biomedicine here. Everything is sort of generic technology using standards, uh, semantic web approaches. What we can do and what we have done in, on, a, on a small scale is allow ontologies in other areas to be stored in bioportal. And people are creating metadata templates in areas outside of biomedicine. So for example, my colleague, John Graybeal is working with a bunch of engineers in Denmark who are interested in, in uh, uh, physical science and uh, climatology. And we have a whole series of metadata templates and ontologies in CEDAR now that deal with collecting data from marine-based windmills. That doesn't really sound biological to me. And it shows you that this, this kind of system is really quite open. And uh, one thing I may not have emphasized is that my team is really eager to collaborate with anybody who may view this kind of work as valuable. And we love to see CEDAR being used in other areas because we think the ability to uh, have arbitrary ontology stored in our ontology repository, as well as uh, templates for a variety of scientific disciplines in CEDAR really would give us new, new, new ways of studying this kind of work. Well, as you see in a, in a moment, we have data infrastructures for uh, learning data and uh, the metadata 
challenge is one I totally appreciate. And I just sent uh, my, my software team a link to your website. So thank you. Yeah, I know. And, and if you want to collaborate, just drop me a line. That's great. Thank you. Mark, I have a question for you. So uh, Cedar, Cedar seems awesome. Um, if we, is it an open source project if we wanted to contribute to it? Um, it's, yes, it is an open source project. You can see everything in GitHub. We're trying to make it increasingly modular. It's not uh, engineered in a way which makes it really easy to plug in new components. But again, uh, we're, willing to, we're very eager to collaborate. And so uh, it is certainly something where we, we, we can work on the software engineering as well as applying it in new application areas. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions, anyone? Great. Well, we're running. We're actually running ahead of schedule. Ken, you're up in five minutes. So if any, everyone wants to take like a five minute bio break, uh, we can loop back around in five minutes. And uh, Ken, uh, you're up. So if you want to share your side. Ken, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Same old Zoom error. Yeah, I'll, I'll test it just to make sure. Uh, yep, we see it. And. There you go. Great. Perfect. All right. So let's start at 9.25. Or sorry, I guess that's uh, 12.25. 12.25. Great. Hey, Ken. Let's, uh, so you're on mute. I'm gonna start with your introduction. So Ken Kodinger, uh, hopefully I pronounced that right, um, is a professor of human computer interaction and psychology at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Dr. Kodinger has a MS, a master's degree in computer science and a PhD in cognitive psychology and experience teaching in an urban high school. His multidisciplinary background supports his research goals of understanding human learning and creating educational technologies that increase student achievement. His research has contributed new principles and techniques for the design of educational software and has produced basic cognitive science research results on the nature of student thinking and learning. Cuttinger directs LearnLab at learnlab.org, which started with 10 years of National Science Foundation funding and is now the scientific arm of CMU Simon Initiative. LearnLab builds on the tasks of cognitive tutors and approach to online personalized tutoring that is in use in thousands of schools and has been repeatedly demonstrated to increase student achievement. For example, doubling what all algebra students learn in a school year. He was a co-founder of Carnegie Learning Incorporated that has brought cognitive tutor-based courses to millions of students since it was formed in 1998 and leads LearnAb, now the scientific of Senior Assignment Initiative. <laughs> Dr. Codinger has authored over 250 peer-reviewed publications and has been a product up, a project investigator on over 45 grants. In 2017, he received the Hillman Professorship of Computer Science, and in 2018, he was recognized as a fellow of cognitive science. So Ken, off to you. Well, thanks for that uh, wonderful and thorough introduction. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, use of data to understand learning and to try to improve it, particularly through uh, implementations of educational technology. And in the process, I'll be illustrating a couple of data infrastructures that we've created with generous support from NSF, including a data shop and LearnSphere. And I invite you to go to those websites and, and try them out yourself. Uh, so the, the key messages I wanna make uh, today are first uh, that in education, there really are a vibrant set of activities around data discovery and reuse. And it started in older fields of AI and education and learning sciences and in AI and education, there's been a lot of effort to create so-called intelligent tutoring systems that mimic human tutors. And, and uh, in, in the last 10 years or so, new related fields and associated conferences have emerged, including educational data mining, learning analytics and learning at scale. So there's lots of activity. Uh, a lot of that activity is around uh, doing analytics that 
creates better predictive models. And a lot of it stops there. But I really want to emphasize the importance of going the next step, what we call closing the loop, and using discoveries to actually uh, redesign systems and make predictions and test those predictions in randomized controlled experiments. Uh, a couple discoveries I'll illustrate is one uh, uh, looking at how students engaging in learn, learning by doing activities appear to learn much more than uh, uh, they do by watching a lecture video or by reading text. Um, but more specifically, I want to probe uh, our efforts at efforts to optimize that learning by doing process by uh, using learning curves uh, to discover hidden skills that lead to edu better educational technology and then to better learning. And I'll, I'll summarize uh, uh, some of these uh, efforts uh, popping up to our web-based infrastructure that's designed to make sophisticated analytics easier for social scientists and educators who don't want to necessarily write Python or R code. As a bit of background, uh, we've had a long history of creating educational technologies, including the math tutors that you heard about in the great introduction. Um, these have been both widely used, but also widely evaluated. And, uh, and perhaps the, one of the biggest uh, educational technology randomized field trials, 140 schools were uh, either 70 were randomly assigned to use this cognitive tutor algebra course that we had developed, where a good chunk, about 40% of that course involves students interacting with our intelligent tutoring system, our cognitive tutors. Uh, but we also used cognitive science to develop the text materials and teacher professional development. So it's kind of big package kind of investigation. The other 70 schools used their traditional uh, algebra uh, um, course materials. And this graphic is meant to illustrate, uh, summarize a key result that the learning gain over school year was essentially doubled for students using the cognitive tutor algebra. And we've done similar development efforts and evaluations with uh, online college courses. The uh, Open Learning Initiative here at Carnegie Mellon University has produced lots of online interactive learning materials, learning by doing opportunities. And one particularly impressive uh, result was from a statistics online course that was uh, adapted through data to optimize student learning such that it was taught in a half of a semester and led to greater uh, learning gains, both on final exams as well as these, these percentages of learning gains are a standardized uh, um, assessment of concepts in statistics. So, so if you know the physics education research is a little bit like the force concept inventory in physics, this is similar general test in, in statistics. The learning gain uh, on the, the standard exams, I'm sure was much bigger, but this shows that not only you got better learning gains in shorter time, but better transfer as well. So uh, these educational technologies provide uh, lots of opportunity to explore learning by looking at the, what's sometimes called the, the data exhaust of student interactions with these systems. And um, the OLI psychology course was used as part of a MOOC that was developed uh, at Georgia Tech where the lecture materials were delivered um, through Coursera um, you know, with videos um, from this Georgia Tech psychology lecture. But the online reading materials and importantly, the interactive learning by doing uh, experiences, these essentially formative assessment questions those were provided by uh, the Open Learning Initiative. And you can see an example here of, of an activity uh, related to dimensions of uh, uh, personality where students get feedback as they drag and drop these different dimensions into this table. Um, if they need, they can get hints as well. So the instruction is embedded in the context of doing as students get a sense for you know, what they know and don't know and then can adapt. Uh, so when we looked at the thousand students that completed the final exam in this course and their variation in watching, reading, and doing 
and used some causal modeling techniques developed here at Carnegie Mellon to build a causal model of the relationships here. So controlling for pretest, do students who engage in more of the bottom, these activities, um, do better across the 11 unit quizzes in the final exam as compared to students who watch more videos or do more reading. And these uh, are standardized coefficients from making each variable essentially a z-score. So this indicates the effect size of, of an extra standard deviation in doing on the total quiz score and then a big effect size of, of the quiz score on the exam. And essentially the summary result here is that learning by doing, I'll, I'll produce positive, so more of all is good, but learning by doing in particular produces six times better learning than by watching or reading. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of other learning science research suggesting that various forms of learning by doing, one of them called deliberate practice are highly effective, but it really depends on how well tailored the activities are to students' needs and they should be designed to address the edge of students' competence. And, uh, you know, we all have our sense of our own learning, but it turns out much of what's going on in the learning process and even the thinking process is below the surface of our conscious awareness. It's been estimated that as much as 70% of expert knowledge is outside of their conscious awareness. So that's a huge opportunity for data to help us gain insight into what's really going on underneath the surface. Uh, when we were building the Algebra Cognitive Tutor, I was interested in, in exploring why story problems are alleged to be so hard um, and, and built a set of assessment items that are matched as these are. Um, we also surveyed math educators and uh, math teachers who suggested, as I thought at the time, that the story problems and the word problems would be harder in the sense that we gave students these kinds of problems, their, their performance, their percent correct, would likely be lower on these two than on the equation. But it turns out that's not what the data said. Uh, what we found, and we replicated this num numerous times, um, uh, is that in fact the equation was the hardest for beginning algebra students. There are some nuances on the form of these problems that will change these results in, in sensible ways, but this result is was striking and important for our design of the algebra tutor but more generally illustrated this idea that experts have a big blind spot with respect to what they know and don't know algebra teachers uh, do not necessarily see into the hidden skills that students need to acquire to be good at equation solving and a lot of it goes to essentially algebra as a language so skills for uh, um, seeing the grammatical structure uh, that the multiplication needs to happen before the addition, so you can't add the 1666, or the asterisk means uh, times, or in the 6x format that the juxtaposition need, need, means times. The semantics, the syntax, the, the grammar, the lexicon of algebra are something our brains are very good at learning by doing, but we don't necessarily realize how much work happened to get us there. And so as experts, we think this is clear and obvious. It just pops into our brain, but it turns out that isn't the way it works for novices. And there's a lot of work that we could help the brain be doing by better optimizing the instruction along the way. So the approach we've taken is represented in this loop where we start uh, um, um, in this particular approach with data from uh, an existing educational technology system, use it to discover these hidden skills, design better instruction to address those hidden skills, and then to deploy a new version of the system in comparison with the old um, to confirm in, in these closed the loop random assignment experiments that we get better outcomes. So I wanna walk you through one of those, and we've done a number of these now, but uh, the source is an intelligent tutoring system. Here's a screenshot, it's a pretty old screenshot, but uh, um, from, uh, a, a, a unit on ge geometric areas. And one of the challenges in this context are getting beyond helping students uh, work on problems that aren't sort of point solutions, a simple formula answers the problem where they have to combine multiple formulas to come up with a solution. And here they're asked to, to figure out the area that's left over when this, uh, the end of the can is cut out of this metal square. And here, uh, this table starts off empty. The students working through the intelligent tutor is tracking their performance. Uh, 
they make an error at this point, they ask the system for help, the system says, at this column wasn't there. The tutoring system suggests they add a column to first find the square area and then add a column to find the circle area and then come back to this. Um, so all of that data is being logged um, and each step here can be coded with respect to uh, progress and learning. So this here's the general frame of an error rate learning curve where we have on the x-axis how many opportunities, which opportunity is this for a student to display their competence in one of these formative assessment activities. When they, if they do struggle, they're gonna get hints or feedback. So they'll get a, these are opportunities to assess, but also opportunities to learn. And what we'd like to see is that the average error rate across students and across components of, of competence, of, across skills and comp, concepts that, that that average error rate goes down. And if we look at a learning curve straight out of a course where we don't code it by any particular uh, topic or concept or skill, just by the order of each activity experienced, we get basically a mess. We don't see a learning curve. The error rate may, is maybe going down for a while and then it blips back up and, and it goes down and blips back up. That generic level of coding the data as though there's just one component of knowledge, geometry, does not lead to a smooth learning curve. And I'm now showing you a screenshot of DataShop. Um, I mentioned one of the infrastructures we built with NSF's help. If you code this data with one component, you don't get a smooth learning curve. Um, but if instead uh, the data, is, same data, is recoded um, with, say, these 12 components, now where this blip up here is maybe when trapezoid area is first introduced. When we recode it in this way, uh, we now can re-average. So this was the 30th opportunity of geometry might be the first opportunity now of trapezoid. And the red data summary here shows the decline in error rate associated with each opportunity to practice. And the blue line is a logistic regression model, that growth model that uh, models both the contributions of the difficulty of each of these knowledge components, the rate at which each is acquired, and the student's overall competence to create a, a reasonable fit to the data. But the key point is this very general contrast here that I made can be used more specifically to probe each one of these 12 components to see if it's showing a smooth learning curve. And when we do that, we see that some of the individual curves even in a reasonably small data set here, um, I think this was uh, 50 some students, uh, we get good learning curves for some components. Some components actually start off with a low error rate, so we could improve the system right away by eliminating that uh, busy work. But what I particularly wanna focus on is those that look like that overall curve. It's got a lot of these upward blips in error. What's going on? Uh, well, this, this particular compose skill labeled uh, the, the step I illustrated earlier of, uh, for example, finding the uh, leftover area when you cut a circle out of a square. And there were tons of problems like this. Sometimes it's adding a triangle on top of a square. There are various versions of it. Uh, but what we saw is that error rate varied quite a bit. All of these steps here are essentially the same idea, the same procedure as taking two areas and, and subtracting or sometimes adding them but the error rate was much higher in this one, um, very low for these and sort of medium in here. And the key insight that we came to was that when you provide scaffolding for students, which is meant to help aid their learning, they actually, it's sometimes over scaffolding. They don't have to do as much of the planning work with the scaffolding provided. Here, they have to demonstrate that they can do the planning on their own. This scaffolding, is often used as an instructional manipulation, but may not be very effective. Um, and it turns out uh, we can model this more formally, um, um, these discoveries, and I hope you're tracking the loop that I'm going around. We've deployed, we have data, we've made a discovery, but now we're gonna redesign. So uh, a particular strategy is when you've got a hidden skill that students need more practice on, design tasks so that's the thing they practice. Um, and this is the key deliberate practice idea, certainly popular in athletics where we'll practice kicking the soccer ball into the upper right corner of the goal. But this works for cognition too, like in reading uh, phonics as a version of this kind of focus. 
But here the particular focus is we're just going to ask them to plan a solution. They don't actually have to execute it. Um, and when we do that, we see in the treatment, now this is the closed the loop random assignment experiment, that we can re reduce a lot of the time they're spending on individual formulas, most, most of which they've pretty well mastered. We might have overdone it a little bit, uh, but we dramatically increase the, the time they spend on these planning steps. Uh, overall, they're spending 25% less time. Uh, some people say, who cares about time? But if you think about that at scale, 25% less time for learning means three years for college rather than four. Uh, and importantly, we get a, a positive effect on better learning. So we've been through this loop a number of times now, and we've built some automated AI search methods to facilitate it. And there's papers about that. They also lead to better close the loop outcomes. Uh, but let me just, uh, um, I didn't start a timer here, but I'm, I hope I'm doing okay with time. I just want to- Yeah, can you a, have about a minute left? A minute left, okay. Um, just say a little bit about data shop we built first and you can share data in any format, but if you share it in the standard format, you get a whole lot of these analytic tools for free. LearnSphere has been an effort to allow folks to share analytic components. Um, and you can go to learnsphere.org and see that. In particular, we have this web-based workflow authoring tool where there's a menu of analytic components that can be dragged out here and configured in various ways. And that can the, the connections between these components are a data table data flow and the user can adjust the inputs, um, this is comparing actually different statistical models for these learning curves and then see the output. Uh, so importantly, we're helping uh, educator, education researchers, psychologists, folks, again, who want to do these kinds of an analytics, um, as well as helping folks who are developing new analytics share it by creating those analytic components and uploading them into LearnSphere. Um, so, uh, um, I will stop there and, and see if there's any questions. All right. Thank you so much, Ken. Any other questions? No questions. Ken, are you going to be available on the Slack or uh, on the Zoom chat after this? Um, I, I guess there's a session immediately following this. That, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I can uh, go to the uh, uh, open area. And, uh, I think I, I'm forgetting what it's called, but uh, I, I've, I've been in the environment before. Great, awesome. So if anyone has any questions, Ken, please, uh, please do there. And if you want to get a demo of the platform, we can also uh, go to Gather Town later. Gather so, Town is what I was trying to think yeah. of earlier. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, so I'd like to, to introduce. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, it's Dr. Adriana Kovashka. So uh, Adriana is an assistant professor in computer science at the University of Pittsburgh. She was my professor when I took her computer vision class. Uh, her research interests are in computer vision and machine learning. She has authored 18 publications in top tier computer vision, artificial intelligence conferences and journals like CVPR, ICCV, NeurIPS, you know all the names. And 10 second tier conference publications like BMVC, uh, you know, ACCV. She served as an area chair for CPR in 2018 and 2021, NeurIPS, ICLR, AAAI. And she's gonna serve as the co-program chair of ICCV 2025, which is planning way out there. Uh, she has been on program committees for over 20 conferences and journals and has co-organized seven workshops. And her research is funded by the NSF, Google, Amazon, and Adobe. Adriana, welcome. Really excited to have you here. Uh, thanks for the introduction uh, very much. I got a weird Zoom warning. Hopefully you can see my slides. Yes. Good to go. Yep. No. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. Thanks again for the, sorry, for the introduction uh, and for inviting me. So... Yeah, my research is about doing two things that they're kind of hard to make compatible, but one is understanding uh, media and intent and persuasion in the media, and the other is actually using weak supervision to, to accomplish this. But along the way, I've also collected plenty of uh, not so weakly supervised data sets. 
Um, so probably don't need to convince you, especially uh, you know nowadays as we have things coming up that uh, the media affects public opinion and the societal outcomes like elections and whatever follows after those. Um, so we want to understand implications in the media. In other words, we wanna understand the agenda the different media uh, content has. Um, so we've looked at uh, earlier on, we looked at visual advertisements and then we looked at images and text and political articles. And the challenge here is that data is limited. So you can take all kinds of pictures of dogs and cats and mountains, um, and we have lots and lots of those, but images with intent and with some kind of agenda are not as abundant. Uh, and of course, also annotating them is, is expensive because they appeal to a human audience with all of the human audiences, uh, you know, knowledge acquired along the way. So it's expensive to annotate them with all the knowledge that these require to actually properly analyze. So the goal is to learn some useful models from whatever data is already available, uh, even if that data is noisy. And at least kind of where I'm trying to take this re research nowadays. Um, so just a, you know, a motivating uh, image, a motivating slide with some images that are um, very powerful and impactful in their time. Uh, like the first one is from the 60s, second one is from the 90s. Basically, these are said to have, to, to have changed society in some way. Um, is an overall summary. I, I, I got interested in looking at advertisements and I have some examples at the bottom uh, because even though you know you might dislike ads because they're trying to manipulate you, they're actually very, some of them are very interesting uh, and creative and require basically AI to be solved to actually understand. So we're not gonna really understand them completely but we're trying to get some of the way there. So we argue that state-of-the-art vision systems are inadequate to describe the messages hidden behind purposefully created um, ads, such as this one that you have here. So, hopefully, it's somewhat clear what this, you know, what this ad is saying. Um, I'll have our ground truth answer. Um, and vision systems we know nowadays are are much better than they used to be, you know, five or ten years ago. And we can fairly uh, reasonably annotate them with recognized concepts or objects or even generate full sentence descriptions. However, these descriptions miss kind of the, the point of the ad. They miss what the ad means, which may be footed Burger King must taste really good since even the competitors and employee secretly buys it. So you have to recognize Ronald McDonald from his shoes, maybe in his hair. And you also have to recognize, and this is requires common sense uh, reasoning. You have to, uh, to recognize that he's secretly buying it because he's wearing this, this trench coat. He's trying to be in disguise. And you know, vision systems don't can do this just because they were never trying to to understand meaning. So this is our goal to understand meaning and intent of these ads. Uh, some challenges to understand what these all of these various ads and public service announcements mean. Uh, pu a purely visual challenge is that a non-trivial fraction of them uh, show objects in very creative ways, very typical ways. So a standard vision system trained on ImageNet or whatever photorealistic data set you want is not going to do well um, on these. So part of our research is focused on developing um, robust representations that actually generalize across these you know, modalities such as photorealistic or, or art painting or whatever. So this is kind of a, an offshoot into a more mainstream direction of, of domain adaptation and generalization. There's uh, also a visual challenge uh, is there's implied physical processes in these ads like melting and crushing more on the reasoning end, there's associations that humans um, have acquired over the years, like guns are dangerous and that maybe we, we get from media or from experience, I'm not sure. Some of them are from experience, but not all of them. Uh, so guns are dangerous, China is fragile, uh, you know, hot sauce is hot and, and oven mitts are hot, but in a different way. So these are all the challenges. Um, to get started, uh, a few years ago, we collected this advertisement data set which for something, you know, it's not as large as the, the numbers you've seen for other image data sets, but for something that um, requires actual human authorship um, and, you know, significant thought, it's, it's pretty reasonable. So we have about 65,000 uh, images with various annotations that we crowdsource with various mechanisms to ensure quality. Uh, so this is for images and we have another one for uh, videos, but much smaller. And you can think of these videos as being stories that we can uh, we can analyze. 
um, is an example of a task we'd like to solve on this data set. We want for um, the vision algorithm to multimodal in the algorithm to match an image like this, where you see a crash motorcycle. So this is more of a PSA than a, than a product ad. So we want the algorithm to match this image with text somewhat like this. So I should be careful on the road so I don't crash and die. As opposed to something like this, um, which is in terms of objects mentioned, it's, it's close, but it's actually the opposite. So clearly this very somber ad is not trying to say buy a motorcycle and go very fast because that would be a happier um, image. So we have some way of representing regions in these images, the slogans, so the text that's embedded in these images. Here we have um, something cool that we um, we focused on, which is symbolism in ads. So you have um, you know trees and grass and fruits symbolizing nature, and then you have guns and bullets and uh, knives symbolizing danger. And ads kind of appeal to these the symbolism a lot. And you know this is part of what people study in media studies is how uh, is symbolism in, in visual rhetoric. And then as a way of transferring knowledge and transferring data essentially from uh, other data sets, we, we don't have on this data set, we don't have objects annotated, but we do have, we can generate predictions from another model. So we get these uh, dense captions that give us a proxy for what the objects in the image are. And basically what we do here is we, we put all these things together to get an image representation. And then we do metric learning where we try to, sorry, where we try to bring this image uh, representation close to the representation for the correct piece of text. Um, as a high level idea of what the results show, basically if you look at ads, so ads have the, the image part, but they also have a slogan embedded. And these results uh, show that the text is more useful for decoding uh, the message of the ad. And the message here, uh, I should have made this more clear, is the message is basically this. Um, it, it's what you're supposed to do, what the ad calls for you to do, which is I should be careful on the road. And then it also provides a reason. Um, and the reason is so you don't crash and die. So we want the system to be able to retrieve this message. And if it uses the slogan alone, it's much better than using the visual alone, just because the visual is very ambiguous. Um, I can skip that. Uh, on video, you, you similarly to images have visual and textual channel. The textual here is speech. And we generally find that um, if you just use a speech in videos to try to predict the message, it's actually a lot less useful. So speech is, is less cleanly mapped to the message of the ad or, or vice versa. So speech is still more ambiguous than slogans and static ads. And here's an example of how our method can correctly retrieve the right statement for this. So I know there's boxes are related here, but the boxes are kind of importance regions and the ad is actually this lady is putting on uh, lipstick, but it's actually a cigarette. And so this ad is meant on first sight to look like, a, you know, maybe a beauty ad or makeup ad. But actually, if you look closer, um, that's kind of where the, you know, power of ads comes in is that there's some kind of twist. Um, so the twist is that it's a, it's a stop smoking kind of ad and our method can correctly figure that out. But um, in terms of using less knowledge, which was my motivation here, um, you know, humans have a lot of contextual knowledge, a lot of world knowledge. Usually these ads are not targeting newborns, they're targeting adults that have a lot of experience. And so this experience, we, our current method doesn't really have that. We don't want to just learn it in, with supervised learning. We want to be able to retrieve it from, you know, just like humans rely on a knowledge base in their head, we want to kind of um, utilize such a knowledge base as an actual knowledge base. Here we look at DBpedia. The problem with that is that a lot of um, information you can retrieve about any entity is not going to be relevant. So if you try retrieving information about Nike, the sports company, here you get Nike, that's good, but you also have Nike the asteroid, Nike the, the Greek uh, goddess, and so on and so forth. So we have, um, as, as a way of dealing with that, our algorithm, uh, first of all, can, can learn which pieces of information are relevant and can also to make its training more robust, kind of drop information at training time. And by drop, I mean entire words um, to accomplish more robust training. But the benefit of that is here we have a graph that shows you regions in the image and kind of parts of the slogans. Um, so this is our method. This is like a, a, a more basic version of our method. So the full version of our method can more appropriately utilize external information like Chanel is a French privately held company, 
or here, um, this is the deer made of trash and the slogan says, uh, rubbish can be recycled, nature cannot. So it correctly retrieves information about what nature means as opposed to getting information about say nature of the magazine. And so basically it's use of external knowledge is, is uh, significantly more accurate than other methods. Um, this, the problem of understanding ads is challenging also because of the relationship between the images and the texts in these images. So here's a you know more typical ad um, for clothing and it says winter collection. And this is nowhere out of the ordinary. We've seen lots of images like that, but then this image also says winter collection and it's just the person dressed in a cardboard box. So I can, you know, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna pause and ask if you, know what this is about but basically this is a public service announcement against human trafficking uh this one is a typical clothing ad and so there's there's kind of a you know a, an interplay of vision language here that's that's interesting that prior methods haven't looked at because prior methods in terms kind of vision language method has looked at captioning and captioning is just both image and text are kind of redundant but here image and text actually complementary and work together to convey a message um, so we've looked at whether co just because image and text co-occur doesn't mean they're actually redundant or identical. So we've looked at whether image and text are parallel or not. And our goal here is to do this in somewhat, you know, weekly supervised or unsupervised way. Um, we've also looked at generating ad appropriate uh, faces. Again, here we're trying to reuse data from prior models. So we 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 see in this example that faces are fairly um, you know, distinct for different ad categories. And we want to generate them, but our data is diverse yet very limited in count. So standard generation approaches don't work. So instead what we do is we learn, what we do learn on our data set is a very sparse attribute signature for each category, such as domestic violence ad faces are going to contain something like black high, which we think of as an attribute. And then we learn, so we learn the signature from our data set, but we, then we learn how to um, go from each attribute to actual pixel space on a entirely separate data set. Um, and here's an example result that we get. So as, um, as an extension of, from this fairly kind of niche and focused space of ads, we've gone back to something more uh, mainstream where we try to actually discover uh, regions and, and learn about objects from weak supervision. So here's an example that kind of motivated this, but basically uh, we were able to discover in our ads data set uh, these Oreos and ketchup and so on. So it's like we learned an object detection model without actually having uh, data specifically for this, without having any boxes as annotations. Uh, so we have this approach where we try to learn from unstructured text, like captions in this case. So from unstructured text that by no means mentions all the objects in the image and definitely doesn't mention their locations. Uh, we learn to actually localize objects so, such that at test time, we actually can provide a box with, with rather non-trivial and fairly competitive um, accuracy by learning to model the, the ambiguity in text. So here we have three captions for this image. Uh, actually, you know, he has a tie. None of the captions mention a tie. But we can, you know, we have a variety of methods for actually getting the, the pseudo-label tie, even though it's not in our caption. And lastly, um, we've also looked more recently at, so previous stuff was about ads. Um, then more recently, we've looked at rhetoric in political articles, which are multimodal. And what we want to do is we want to give it an image, predict whether it comes from a left-leaning or right-leaning uh, media source. So the, we have images and pair lengthy articles, but we just want to predict bias or leaning from uh, the images. Uh, for training, we're going to use weak labels, uh, such as the bias of the media source. And we know media, media source biases from, uh, from this website. So we only have uh, labels at the source level and they may or may not be correct or relevant for any particular instance. Um, we have a data set of about 1 million unique images with fair text. So we are going to use a text, but we're only going to use it at training time. So we're not going to use it to classify a test time. We're just going to use it as a, an auxiliary uh, modality, auxiliary feature. Um, so our approach basically uses the text. So, so our observation is that bias in text is uh, more obvious. So we're going to have this two-stage approach where um, at 
in the, our first stage of tra training, we do use text as an input. And we uh, basically learn an entire you know, CNN, including the feature extraction from images and text. But then in a stage two, we, we just retain the feature extraction part, but get rid of the, the text input. And then we just learn a, a single you know, shallow classifier on top of the pre-extracted um, image features. Because here, we're not trying to classify objects. We're trying to classify left or right bias. So actually it turns out features, image features learn on, on ImageNet or whatever is not, are not actually very useful. Um, and just as, a, as an example of our prior method for generation and to show that there is actually significant visual bias in how the same person is shown on the left and the right, we learned to generate uh, faces of well-known politicians without any extra data. Uh, so here are some examples of the photos that we're going to actually modify to be more left to right leaning, and we're going to make them very extremely left or extremely right, just to show the effect more cleanly. Uh, so here's our not so great reconstruction, but what's interesting is kind of what happens if you take all of these pictures. So here, this is a smile. Here, we kind of retain the pose, you know, his mouth is far down, so it's technically the same, you know, the same pose of the face, but now it's, our model learned that what's going to happen is that the same face is now going to look angry um, on the left. On the right, where there wasn't a smile, there's going to appear a smile. Or where there was, you know, even anger, um, there's going to appear um, a smile. So uh, I do have only one minute. So maybe I just want, and, and the reverse happens on the right. Um, we have a method that goes back to something more common, which is retrieval, which is given in a political image retrieval uh, text. And we have this new metric learning approach. Uh, but I'm going to stop there um, and see if there's, if I have 30 seconds for, uh, for questions. Any questions, anyone? You can put them in the chat or just speak out loud. I have a right. quick question. Go ahead, please. Uh, I'm wondering uh, uh, whether feature engineering plays a role. And I guess at some point you were talking about uh, like expert input into this. And uh, yeah, can you say a little bit about? Yeah, uh, so we, um... we could, so a, a more strongly supervised setting here would be to like, take an image and say which parts of this image make it left leaning or right leaning. So if you have say, uh, this is kind of our silly, you know, made up example of, um, I don't know, a, 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 there's values associated with the left and the right. Um, and so maybe if you see a table of people sitting and having dinner, that's kind of a, a conservative value or whatever. Um, so someone could take images and tell us like what parts of them are, are associated with a certain leaning. Uh, but we don't want to do that. We still want to at test time, just classify things that actually have a bias rather than say classifying images of cats as being left or right leaning. So at test time, we do have, they're not actually um, expert labels, they're crowd labels, but we ensure uh, consensus in those. Um, yeah, there's a lot of like media literature that we could use here to kind of learn better features, but we, we our motivation was not to do that. We do have a baseline that's a little bit more strongly supervised with, with actual concepts that are associated with left and the right. Um, but we do comparable to it with this, this week's supervision. Okay, thank you for the question. Great. Yeah, okay. thanks, Aran. Thanks, Adriana. That was a fascinating talk. Um, like amazing work as always. So thank you. Uh, we're gonna break now for lunch uh, and a closer session on Gather Town. So uh, about until two ten p.m. Eastern, uh, we're gonna be on break. So. Uh, feel free to hang out here, uh, feel free to hang out on gather.town, but um, let's meet back at uh, 2.10 for a fireside chat with the one and only Marshall LaBerre.